Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this Sabbath that you have set aside for us to come before you, to worship you, to put aside our thoughts of work, our thoughts of the other activities that we do, and come before you today, worshiping you, remembering the creation week and what it means, but also helping us to remember what you've done for us. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be here as we open the word today. I pray that you use me to speak to each of us, help us to hear the message that is right for us in this day. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the title of the message is Value. And if you read, if you follow along our scripture, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. And the verse says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Do you see a value statement in that verse? When I say value, what usually comes to mind? Like getting what you paid for? We were at the grocery store yesterday. Ouch. Ouch. I was talking to Andrea afterwards, I and mean, it's been a number of years, but I remember as a young person in Colorado, we would go to the grocery store once a month, and uh, we would fill two carts overflowing with food. It was about $400. That was a lot of money back then for a lot of food. It doesn't go nearly as far today. Yeah, not quite so far. But... but when we think about value, it's getting what we paid for or getting more than we paid for. Good value is something to be looked for. Um, get a good value for the money that you spend. Getting good service for the amount that you paid for. I think of the word value, it's, it's often tied to like a monetary significance. But, but like many other words, value has a lot of different meanings. So I wanted to define what I'm going to refer to value here today. It's the regard that something is held to deserve the importance or the worth or the usefulness of something. What are some things that you value? I'll pause for just a moment and let you think about that. What are some things you value? These last couple years have really changed probably what we value. Um, you know, we've, had got, we've got COVID still. We have monkeypox. We have several other viruses I've read about that are, I don't really know the names, we've got some impacting babies, we've got some impacting different places in the world, these other various diseases, you know, that seem to be pretty prominent nowadays. So I think about my health, my health, the health of my family, the health of all of you, the health of my extended family. Um, I value my job. I just started a new job. This last week was unlike many weeks or the last several years. <clears throat> but many people are still struggling to find work, you know, work that will provide a livable wage. There's lots of jobs out there. They don't pay all that well, especially when it costs $3 for a loaf of bread, whereas just a couple of years ago, it was probably less than a dollar. And some are still trying to find a job at all, whether or not, you know... <laughs> You're a college-educated, college graduate, maybe highly degreed, and you're working in a service job, you know, carrying groceries to cars, flipping burgers. That was just one thing we always talked about as a kid. Those were entry-level jobs that high school kids took or college students took to help pay for their other activities. But now some people are finding that that's the job they can get, and they will value that job because it provides something. We value stability. Right? This is a little bit of an unstable time right now with, the, with wars and rumors of wars and illnesses and just inflation and other things going on. Um, we value our homes, our cars that get us to and fro to jobs back and forth. Some of us value it a little more than others probably today. Our relationships with each other, with our families, with, with God. And maybe we even value our reputation as, as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist. How do we assign value to something? What, 
constitutes what something's worth. Is it how much that we paid for it? Is it how much we worked for it? How much effort we put into getting it? Some things can be inexpensive, but if it took a lot of effort to get it, it might be worth more than something that didn't cost you anything but was free, freely given to you. Do we truly know the value of things? Some things get an increase in their value depending on who you are, where you're at in life. I remember when I was young, a driver's license was highly valued because it meant a little bit of freedom. Didn't really understand the responsibility behind it, but there was freedom in that. Now, as an adult, you think about driver's license, it's just a tool, but along with that value comes a burden of responsibility to pay for your car, you have to pay for your insurance, you have to pay for gas. Again, ouch. A lot of the value for one thing sometimes can come with a cost. A sick person may value the sunrise or the smell of the flowers, whereas a healthy person, you know, may value hard work or their reputation and they just give a passing glance at some of these other things. I think that's why Sabbath is so important because it kind of helps us it's a great equalizer. We all come before the Lord the same, in a sense. And when then we can start to take stock of the things that the Lord values. But what if all of these things were taken away from us? Or they were much more difficult to get? Would that increase their value? A couple years ago, toilet paper was pretty valuable. <laughs> Some of the other essentials of life were pretty valuable. You'd go to the grocery store and entire aisles would be empty. Bread aisle, I remember, looked like a bomb had gone off in there. Certain things that we value, though, fresh vegetables and things, it was like hardly touched, which was kind of nice. But, but really, seriously, there were things that were hard to come by that, were, that became very valuable. You could find things for sale on eBay. People would, would stock up and hoard certain supplies. Um, Things are getting a little bit more difficult to find nowadays, and primarily because of it's difficult to transport it. The value of a truck to transport a product from a port to the center of the United States where then it can be distributed. Helen deals with this with her work, not food stuffs, but other things. It is really, really expensive to drive a big truck uh, anywhere in the country now. And so that increases the goods, it increases the perceived value of something because of the scarcity or the difficult difficulty it is to get to you. So then that begs this question. Should we find value in these earthly things? Things like possessions or health, yours, mine, hard work, relationships, nature, value in ourselves. We talked about this morning in Sabbath school the, the, the idea or the thought around dying to self. What that means. Is there a process to that? How do we, how do we achieve that daily sacrifice of self to be, to be connected to the Lord? So think back when you were younger. Maybe when you got your first I don't know, for me, it was G.I. Joe action figures. No, actually before that, my mom used to buy me stuffed animals. I had a, a monkey, a stuffed little monkey, and that thing would go everywhere with me. It had Velcro hands, so I'd Velcro it around parts of my body and carry it with me around the house. My brother had a little hand puppet. It was called Mortimer. It was a little dragon. He carried that everywhere. My mother still has that puppet. Oddly enough, it's been patched, I don't know how many times. There was value in those things, right? I mean, maybe you got a doll or something handmade that someone gave you, a, a family member, a grandmother, or someone gave you something that they had spent time in. The value of something like that, it can increase because of the sentimental value or because of the effort someone put into providing it to you. Did you value that? Did you take care of it? Did you make sure it didn't get lost? Did you take it to the dinner table with you, maybe even take it in the bathroom and put it on the toilet where you were in the tub because you had to have it with you all the time. Does anyone have a, a, a security blanket? I'd never had the blanket. That mine was a monkey. 
things can, can, can contain strange value to us. Um, when we're young, we begin to learn what, what is valued, primarily by watching other people or by being told this is valuable. Um, we see our parents and our siblings, friends and relatives, and, and we, we learn what they value. And all of these things, they can influence and shape our idea of what's valuable or what's not valuable. Experiences can, can have value, right? I know the Laverde just went down to Robbers Cave State Park for an experience. It wasn't free, I'm sure, right? Food, gas, time away from work, things like that. An experience can have value. People pay a lot of money for an experience, sometimes specific experiences. <clears throat> but on the other hand, there are some experiences that are free, but they aren't worth having. So I want to look at uh, two individuals in the Bible, and you're going to recognize them. So uh, the, I'm reading primarily from Patriarchs and Prophets. Uh, this is going to be, oh, I won't give it away, I'll, I'll just read. So Patriarchs and Prophets, starting on page 177. She says, The promises made to Abraham and confirmed to his son were held by Isaac and Rebekah as the great object of their desires and hopes. With these promises, Esau and Jacob were familiar they were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance, for it included not only an inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family, and in the line of his posterity, the Redeemer of the world would come. That's an interesting thought, because they knew that through their family, through their, their line, the Redeemer would come. That's a... a an amazing thought to think about. Now, they didn't exactly know how long, but they understood what was going to happen. On the other hand, there were obligations resting on the possessor of the birthright. So sometimes what you get comes with, I wouldn't call them strings, but maybe conditions, responsibilities. We talked about it, you know, owning a car, there's a lot of responsibility there. Not that these compare, but bring a bit down to something we can relate with right today. He who should inherit its blessings must devote his life to the service of God. Like Abraham, he must be obedient to the divine requirements. In marriage, in his family relations, in public life, he must consult the will of God. There's no running off and joining the circus, right? There's responsibilities associated with this. Isaac made known to his sons these privileges and conditions and plainly stated that Esau, as the eldest, was the one entitled to the birthright. But Esau had no love for devotion, no inclination to a religious life. The requirements that accompanied the spiritual birthright were an unwelcome and even hateful restraint to him. We know the story, right? We can picture in our minds Esau just not participating. He should have been preparing and learning the ways to lead the family in worship, to leading, I mean, it wasn't just him, his brother, his father, and sister. It was the extended family, including their servants, including everyone around. That was the responsibility. I can see him just grabbing his favorite mate and running off into the fields to go, to go hunting, to go foraging, leaving that to, to someone else to manage, to take care of, because that wasn't what he wanted to do. His self was more inclined to go and do these other things. The law of God, which was the condition of the divine covenant with Abraham, was regarded by Esau as a yoke of bondage. When we talk about the Ten Commandments, we talk about, like when we describe them to our children, we think about them as, as guideposts, um, like the fences that help us to be safe, right? They aren't, they aren't restrictions upon us. They're to help us understand what we shouldn't do. It's not a burden to us, right? Thou shalt not steal. I don't know if that's a burden, right? It's kind of telling you not to do something that's going to be harmful to you. Honor your father and your mother. Sometimes that may feel like a burden, but it's really not. It's showing the proper respect for authority. It's surrendering, which can be liberating when you don't have to think about 
or worry about certain things because the parents are taking care of it. All of these things he thought of as a yoke of bondage. He was bent on self-indulgence. He desired nothing so much as liberty to do as he pleased. Brian touched on that this morning and a thought came to me. If you've ever been to a seminar where they talk about music or, or other things, they, they talk about um, Crowley is his last name. You know, what was his, his thing was very much into the Alistair Crowley, right? So what is, what is his mantra? Do as thou wilt. It's basically Satan's motto. Don't be restrained by anything. Everything is, is all what you think is right, relative morality. But the Ten Commandments help us to see the character of God. It helps us to, to stay away from being bent on self, self-indulgence. It's a law of liberty, is what we call the Ten Commandments, right? It liberates us to be free to work within the bounds that God has created for us. But to him, it was a yoke of bondage. To him, power and riches, feasting and reveling were happiness. Sounds a bit like the world today. I mean, when we, I don't go delving too deeply into the news or any, any, anything like that. I try not to. It's pretty, it's a pretty sad state of affairs. But what is the world focused on right now, primarily? It's all about self-indulgence and, and the self-image and pleasing yourself, making sure that what you do is, is it's all you. Be your authentic you, right? And where there's a portion of that that I think is important because the Lord made each of us unique, there's a portion of it that also is about selfishness. Because I don't want to be the authentic Brad. That Brad's not very good. That Brad's not very nice. I want to be the Brad that the Lord wants me to be. But the world isn't about that today. I read an article um, Wednesday, I think it was. It talks about there was a, a Rasmussen poll, maybe Pew. So reputable um, pollsters in the country, and they were doing a poll on Christianity. And they were, they, obviously the sample size is not very large, but statistically speaking, it can actually be accurate. They were saying since 2007 to today, the percentage of Americans that claim some sort of Christian leaning went from 90% to 69% from 2007 to today. The percentage that say, uh, hopefully I get this right, the percentage that say they have, um, they have atheistic or uh, you know, totally not um, a religious leaning at all went from 13% to 29%. So we can see the percentage went from 90 to whatever, 69, wasn't people who claimed that they didn't believe in God, but they have either no religious denominational affiliation or they don't claim any specific creed of Christianity. So we can see these two ends of this spectrum. One shrank and one got larger. I don't think this group went to this group. I think people are being more vocal about it. That's a troubling thought, and we think about why that is. Ivor Myers did a, he, he had a message on this that he said during the French Revolution, Christianity was the result of the French Revolution, or claimed Christianity, because the Christians of the day were terrible. And so the people rebelled against that. And that brought about the French Revolution and then all kinds of other things. Are we seeing that today? Potentially that Christianity today and its Christian nationalism and, and the hypocrisy that is displayed in the Christian world. I use air quotes here for Christian because it covers a lot of, it's a broad spectrum. Is that driving people away? Are we? Because we're seeing it in our churches. We're seeing youth leaving. We're seeing young adults leaving because it just isn't. The churches aren't focusing on a relationship, a transforming relationship with God. They're like Esau. They want all the revelry and the music and the, the feel good. And when that goes away, what do they have to, what's the draw? What's the need to even come to a church?
Esau glorified in the unrestrained freedom of his wild, roving life. Rebecca remembered the words of the angel as she read, uh, and she read with clear insight, then did her husband the character of their sons. She's not referring just to Esau here, because she was convinced that the heritage of divine promise was intended for Jacob. And she repeated to Isaac the angel's words, but the father's affections were centered upon the elder son, and he was unshaken in his purpose. Before we say too much about Esau and how bad Esau was, we want to keep in mind that Jacob had some issues as well. He had learned from his mother of the divine intimation that the birthright should fall to him. And he was filled with an unspeakable desire for the privileges which it would confer. It was, not, it was not the possession of his father's wealth that he craved. The spiritual birthright was the object of his longing. Contrast that with Jesus as a young man. Do you think Mary shared with him who he was? Do you think he knew the purpose of the Savior? Do you think he, he understood as a young, a young man that he, there was something different about him? But did he go and crave it? Did he go and shout it from the rooftops and stand on the corners and cry it out? It's kind of an interesting contrast when we think about this. But when we think about Jacob, he is kind of a type of Christ at a certain point in his life. To commune with God as did righteous Abraham, to offer the sacrifice of atonement for his family, to be the progenitor, I think I said that right, progenitor of the chosen people and of the promised Messiah, and to inherit the immortal possessions embraced in the blessings of the covenant. Here were the privileges and honors that kindled his most ardent desires. His mind was ever reaching forward to the future and seeking to grasp its unseen blessings. So we can see that there's potentially a draw to be overzealous in one side and a draw to be not zealous at all on the other. There's two ditches to the road. Right? And the devil doesn't care which one you fall in, as long as you're in one. With secret longing, he listened to all that his father told concerning the spiritual birthright. He carefully treasured what he had learned from his mother. Day and night, the subject occupied his thoughts until it became the absorbing interest of his life. But while he thus esteemed eternal above temporal blessings, Jacob had not an experimental knowledge of the God whom he revered. So he had this, this head knowledge he understood, and he had mentally assented to what it was, but it, it, didn't, it didn't reach him at a level where he was transformed and changed. That, that came later. <clears throat> His heart had not been renewed by divine grace. He believed that the promise concerning himself could not be fulfilled so long as Esau retained the rights of the firstborn. And he constantly studied to devise some way whereby he might secure the blessing which his brother held so lightly, but which was so precious to himself. What does this sound like? There's a couple of characters in the Bible that, that did similar things. They, they knew what the Lord was going to do. They knew what the plan was. And yet, they couldn't wait. They couldn't let the Lord work out in his time what was to happen. I imagine maybe... When it came to the point, something would happen. I mean, we, we don't know. I can surmise all kinds of things as to how Jacob could have gotten the birthright, but he didn't wait. The Lord was going to work. We think about Abram and Sarah, Sarai. The Lord promised them a son, even at their old age, and, and they just couldn't wait. And then we have today the ramifications of that even. This sounds like Satan and his desire to be like the Lord. Right, to take his place, to take what, what was not his, although he thought it was. He wanted to take what, what he thought was his through guile. How could this be the one identified by God as the father of the 12 tribes? Even God's chosen people sometimes can struggle with these things. We, we talked about it in Sabbath school again. It's that dying to self daily, understanding where your weaknesses are and asking the Lord to put up fortifications to protect you from your own self. Corrupt desire for good things. Esau had lightly valued the blessing 
while it seemed within his reach. But he desired to possess it now that it was gone forever. Remember, um, he came back from, from a hunt and he was, I may be getting ahead of myself. He came back from his hunt and he was hungry. Yeah, it'll be here in just a moment. But he gave it up. Because of his indifference to the divine blessings and requirements, Esau is called in Scripture, in Hebrews 12, 16, he's called a profane person. He represents those who lightly value the redemption purchased for them by Christ and are ready to sacrifice their airship to heaven for the perishable things of earth. Multitudes, this is Ellen White speaking, multitudes live for the present with no thought or care for the future. Like Esau, they cry, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. It's 1 Corinthians 15.32. So let's go back to my first question and think about the things that we value. Are we like Jacob and we're desirous of a spiritual blessing and a spiritual experience? Or are we more interested in the current desires of the flesh like Esau? Letting our physical circumstances cause us to assign value is dangerous ground. Esau sold his birthright for a pot of lentils. He was hungry. He gave in to that carnal nature. There are so many things that the world brings before us that are half wrong and half right. They mix a little with this, a little with that. It's sometimes hard to determine one decision that can lead you down the path. Typically it's not one, but often it can be. So we must always be wary. The sins that so easily beset us, that's why they easily beset us, is because they're there before us. We go and we entertain those things. We are not careful. We're not watchful. We don't pray. We don't guard the avenues to our minds and our souls. There's a t-shirt, and I think it's Little Light Ministries, maybe. They, they've, we bought the kids t-shirts. It said, guard the avenues to your soul. And one of them was your ears, your eyes, your mouth, right? These things that, that they're avenues into our body. What you put in your mouth, people think, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. It was one fruit, right? I mean, it was, there's more to it than that. It was appetite, what you see, you can never unsee something. You may forget it temporarily, but all it takes is a flash to bring it right back. What you hear, same thing, right? Your hearing is probably more acute in certain times than your eyes. I can hear, I can be in a grocery store or a Lowe's or someplace like that and hear the music. And all these memories will flood back that of, of a situation where I heard the song or an environment or just something that was going on. Right, and then you have to, oh, well, let's, let's close out that song because I don't want to hear, I don't want to have those memories, I don't want to think those things anymore. And you don't cherish them, they're just fleeting, they come and go. But it's amazing how powerful things that have gone into your mind can become years after they've been gone. So he gave into the tempta temptation and let appetite rule his thoughts. For us, it could be any number of temptations that we can give into because let's face it, the situation we find ourselves in now where our stability and our comfort and our relationships, jobs and health, all of these things are at risk. And this is only a small sample of what's to come. It's like, it's the appetizer. It's the, it's the food behind the glass that you get to see, but you don't yet get to experience. That's where we're at now. The Bible tells us what it will be like when the tribulation begins. We think it's inconvenient when stores are out of something, or it's depressing when we can't meet in person to worship. All right, it's praise the Lord that we're here today. You know, we really still haven't um, recovered attendance. Some of our church members are not here still. I can think of several that, that are not here with us. It's possible that we've placed too great a value on our creature comforts. So reading again from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 179, she says, They are controlled by inclination, or rather, and rather than practice self-denial, they will forgo the most valuable considerations. If one must be relinquished, the gratification of a depraved appetite or the heavenly blessings promised only to the self-denying and God-fearing, the claims of appetite prevail. 
and God in heaven are virtually despised. How many, even of professed Christians, cling to indulgences that are injurious to health and that benumb the sensibilities of the soul. When the duty is presented of cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, they are offended. Um, when something in the Bible is presented to us that maybe goes against our inclination, uh, does it bother us? That doesn't, that, I'm okay with that. That doesn't impact me. I don't give in to that, right? The Bible says don't do this. It's not a problem for me. I'm okay. There were some things that took us a little bit to get over. Not too many, but a few. Some things, you know, it was readily apparent. It was easy to give up. Are you struggling with some things today that maybe the Bible has shown you years ago that you that come and go, they impact you, you're able to overcome. We need to be careful that we don't continue to let that impact our trajectory of our Christian walk. They see that they cannot retain these hurtful gratifications and yet secure heaven. And they conclude that since the way to eternal life is so straight, they, walk, they will no longer walk therein. People leave the church because of a brother or sister pointing out, maybe not always lovingly, but pointing out something that needs to be changed or adjusted in their life. The Bible tells us when we see something like this to go in love to our brother or sister and share with them. That's scary because there's a possibility they would be offended and then they would turn away from the Lord. But how much more would it be, how much more sorrowful would it be to them to not say something to someone and then let them think it's okay and then one day they find out and they remember back I wish someone had told me I wish I had known now I'm not telling you to go out and take your Bible and hit somebody with it with the scripture you know you're not supposed to do that we have to do it in love we have to do it prayerfully because their salvation is at stake and quite frankly so is yours if we go at something like this inappropriately, what are you doing? You become a stumbling block. So let's be careful. Let's pray. Be considerate. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. We're not little junior Holy Spirits. We are as sinful as the person we're trying to help. So let's, let's be considerate of that. <clears throat> Multitudes are selling their birthright for sensual indulgence. Health is sacrificed. The mental facilities are enfeebled and heaven is forfeited and all for a mere temporary pleasure. An indulgence at once both weakening and debasing in its character. As Esau awoke to see the folly of his rash exchange when it was too late to recover his loss, so it will be in the day of God when, with those who have bartered their airship to heaven for selfish gratification. If we, however, place greater value on spiritual things like the word of God, a righteous character, self-sacrifice, our relationship with Jesus, and forgiveness, then we will begin to seek after these things with greater commitment. These are the steps to dying to self. These are the roadmap, maybe. I wouldn't prescribe like a 12-step process to get to dying to self because it's different for all of us. But these things we all need to do. We all need to focus more, put more value on spiritual things, or like our scripture said, because the natural man does not receive this, the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. We need to have spiritual eyesight to see these things. A righteous character, self-sacrificing, Focusing on our relationship with Jesus and then forgiving. How many of you hold a grudge? You may have, we say, you know, forgive and forget. What does the Lord do with our sins when we confess and we ask for repentance? What does he do with them? Does he just kind of cover that page temporarily? Turn it over? They're thrown into the sea, right? Right? as if they never were. Yet too many of us will hold a grudge against someone because of an injury or some sort of activity. Now, it doesn't mean put yourself in a position where then it can happen again, either to yourself or you do it to someone else, but 
uh, we can impact our ability, our inability to interact with someone if we continue to hold these, these grudges. We've lost church members from this church because there was a conflict between two members. <clears throat> Once we have these things and we, we apply the appropriate value to them, then we will begin to seek after them with greater commitment. Our scripture reading, like I said, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness. In Philippians 3.18, Paul says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do not count them but dung that I may win Christ. How many things did he give up? What does he say there? He suffered the loss of all things. Do you think when he converted that his friends that he used to hang out with, they still hung out with him? They still invited him over for dinner? <laughs> yeah. Right? They wanted to take him out. All things were lost. His position, his prestige, his reputation, gone. Everything, gone. Some of us have probably felt that as well when we devoted our lives to the Lord. Because what are we after? What is the prize? He says it right there. It's that I may win Christ. He uses the word excellency, and I think that shows the value that he placed on it. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Do we know Christ, or is he just an acquaintance? Is he, the, is he our closest friend? Is he the one that we spend the most time with? Or is he one we just talk to on Sabbath? Maybe Wednesday nights. Occasionally when we're or when we're in a predicament? Or is he truly that close friend that you turn to moment by moment, asking for guidance, asking for his Holy Spirit? Romans 8, 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death. That's where I talked about this morning with Bryant when we talked about death is choice. To continue to live carnally minded, that's death. That's... I mean, you're going to die, we are going to die unless the Lord comes back quickly. We will die, and then there's that second death. That was the choice that we made. Because carnally minded, that is death. But spiritually minded is life and peace. When you, per, when you put in perspective the proper perspective of where we are in the world, how we interact with it, the fact that our battles that we fight are not against flesh and blood, but are against what? principalities and powers, spiritual things. Can we fight against those? Can we be a weapon that the Lord can use in that fight? But who's doing the fighting? So God's doing the fighting. That gives peace. I can, be, I can be used, but the Lord does the fighting. During the COVID years, that's what I call them, 2020, 2021, that time where <laughs> the whole world was changed. I think we were all pulled into focusing more on material things due to that situation. Right? I mean, maybe rightfully so. Shortages of things like everything. Tissues, Kleenex, toilet paper, cleaning supplies, rubber gloves, uh, isopropyl alcohol, masks. All of these things that were physical material things just disappeared off the shelves. Huge things they were just gone. Food items were gone. I mean, people were hoarding all kinds of things at the grocery store. They certainly weren't hoarding broccoli or Brussels sprouts. Well, we did. I mean, we joke about these things, but I mean, it's, it's true. The people began to do, hoard crazy things. The food, the, the supply chains were impacted, everything. Huge changes for most of us, but probably the biggest thing was isolation. Different. We all had to stay home for weeks on end. Um, it took us a little while to get up to speed at the church with providing online worship services. I think we did Zoom calls for a time, if I remember correctly. We'd, Alfonso would start the Zoom call at his home, and we could all join as a church, and we could worship together. That's something I'd never done before. It was definitely unique. Remote learning, remote working, remote worshiping. I mean, this is a whole new situation for many of us. 
And like I said, our attendance at church really, uh, it's rebounded pretty well. We're still missing some folks. I'm not sure maybe they went to other churches that started back in person sooner. Um, but you know, people changing to working fully remote, I did. I think, Jose, you did. I know some others probably did as well, full, or changed careers entirely. Um, we're now dealing with inflation like most of us have never seen in our lives. The value of things has gone up. Food and fuel, home prices, pretty much everything's now more costly than, than it was before, or it's even impossible to get. The loss of these material things, however, is real and can cause us distress and fear. But if we have put our full trust in the Lord and we value our relationship with Him above all else, and we lean on Him for guidance and wisdom and our sustenance, do we really need to fear? You got your grocery list and you go to the store and something's missing. I mean, you can do without it, right? Probably for a time. Because the Lord can provide. You, you have other means, other options, other opportunities. Mostly. He will provide our sustenance because we don't really need to fear. He's, what has he told us in the Bible? There are almost many things, right? Cast, oh, no, I don't want to say that's my last sentence, my message. But he's told us that he watches over the sparrows and he sees them. And how much more valuable are we than that? And he cares for all of them. He will care for us. He will take care of us. I think a greater fear than all of these physical things would be undervaluing or placing a misguided value on the spiritual things in our life. I said it before, you know, the unusual time that we're in now, it's minor compared to what is coming. If our spiritual connection with the Lord is suffering now under these conditions, heaven help us when the end comes. I say that very soberly because I know I'm not where I need to be. Let's look at the disciples and the value that they placed on the relationship with Jesus. It was, it was real value. They gave everything, their career, their family, everything to follow the Lord. He had no place to lay his head, neither did they. They were reliant on the, the generosity of others for, for food, for money, for everything. They saw his miracles. They heard his teachings, but their value was just a bit off initially, right, for they perceived value in him, their, their perceived value in him was tied up in the rewards they believed they would have when he set up his earthly kingdom. They've, um, the value they placed was in those worldly things. It was much like everyone else. They were looking for a Messiah to chase the Romans out. They, they misunderstood. Christ, he tried and over and over again to open their eyes, but they didn't really understand it until he was gone. The value of his words really weren't truly understood until... They couldn't hear him speak them anymore. Till they couldn't see him anymore. Till it was scarce or non-existent. They were crushed when he died, at least partially because they placed the value on those wrong things. When we think about the story of Jacob and Esau, we know from the writings of Sister White that Esau only wanted those physical side of the inheritance. He placed no value on the spiritual aspect. Jacob placed value only on the spiritual side. They both misunderstood the balance that's required. Is there a chance that we, as SDA, who know about the closing scenes to come, is there a chance that we're just biding our time waiting for the reward while not really valuing the things that the Lord values? Why does he delay? What are we told is the reason for his delay? He wants everyone to have a chance. He wants everyone to have that opportunity. I think there is a chance that we are biding our time. We're living in the time of the Laodicean church. I'm speaking about God's children, you, me, your neighbor, your dentist, or doctor, your children's teacher, the homeless person on the street. The value that God assigns to each and every one of us is equal to the value of the life of the Son of God. Each of you individually are worth the life of Christ. That's the value that we should place on things. Doesn't, it, doesn't that draw your heart to God? I mean, I, even standing here and saying it kind of chokes me up a little bit. It's almost hard to speak. Because that impact 
on me, when I say those words, when I think about it, has an, has an impact on me. It, it, it's not just a mental ascent. It's, it's something in here that draws me to understand the sacrifice. That's why we sang the song this morning. Doesn't it make you um, want to return that love? Doesn't it make you want to value that connection with him? To share that love with others? So we do that by placing the things we value at the forefront of our thoughts and actions. There's often times we, we kind of, I chide myself too, but I don't have time to do that. Or, yeah, I'll get to that later. And I tell myself, if I valued it, I would do it. If it was important to me, I would make time for it. You kind of gave Andrea a hard time this morning about something about that. If you value something, you'll, you'll appropriately put it into your life. It'll have preeminence. It will, it will take up the majority of your thoughts. It'll take up a large portion of your, your life or all of your life. <clears throat> we spend time in prayer, not just for meals or to, or to receive a blessing for you and your family, but we spend time in prayer for the mother that you saw at the store with her children who is stressed out, right? Kids are getting a little rambunctious, you know, wanting this, wanting that. The mom's a little harried. We pray for her. We pray for the old couple walking down the street in your neighborhood. We pray for the refugee that's come to this country with absolutely nothing. Studying the Word of God, especially now that many of us have more time on our hands. I do. I have more time. I don't commute to work anymore. My commute's less than a minute. So the 20 minutes it takes to drive to work, I should be able to convert that time into something more appropriate, showing the value of, other, of things. Think about your character and the times you don't show grace or forgiveness like you should, like I should. Introspection is really good. There's times when in the car, um, you know, sometimes I listen to Daniel's music in the car. I got his CD in there. Sometimes, though, I have to turn it off because I need to speak to the Lord. I need the Lord to speak to me. Something, I'm about to go somewhere and do something, and I need guidance. I'm about to go to, to Lowe's for one thing. And I'm like, oh, wow, look at that. Oh, that would be so nice to have. Right? It seems harmless. But it, that's the little things that start you down a path, potentially. Not your music. That's not the problem. So, <laughs> hope you understand that. <laughs> Introspection is good. Being able to sit and be still and know the Lord. Introspection to build your character and create a humble heart. The Lord, this, it's Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Why does the Lord say that? Why does he say to be still? Don't we know he's God? I mean, that's not that difficult to understand. But why does he say be still? I think it's to show us where we need to make changes. Where we need to go make amends. Where we need to repair things. Maybe it's to repair the wall in our spiritual relationship with him. Maybe it's to repair a relationship with a friend or a family member. This spiritual growth is needed to help us place proper value on things, I think, in my opinion. I speak to myself primarily because I don't know what any of you are going through, but I do know myself. This last week has been difficult. My son's even pointed it out. I, I seem a little disconnected, a little different this week. Um, I'd like, like to attribute it to the fact that I new job, totally new situation, a little bit of fire hose drinking. I don't know if you know what that means. You go to a new job, all the new stuff at one, at one time is like drinking from a fire hose. Um, but it's also we're revamping the, the office at our house, so there's stuff everywhere. We took everything out so we could change it to put it all back in differently. And that visual clutter is, uh, I don't even know what Helen's going through. She has it a lot worse than I do. Visual clutter can be distracting and cause your mind to not be able to settle and be still because there's just so much visual noise. <coughs> Helping to put proper value. So I've really valued this Sabbath because being up front forces you to think about what you're about to speak. If you've ever been up front, it's sometimes reading these words is really hard because you had to write them 
you had to read them and now I have to speak them and, and it's difficult because I'm the first one to hear it. I read it, it's in my head and then I have to speak it. It speaks to myself very strongly. When we look to the future after the Lord returns and we're taken to heaven, praise the Lord, there are rewards there, right? Home, food, peace, safety, friends. I mean, you can't even describe it all. But that's not really why we want to go there. These are all going to be wonderful, you know, don't get me wrong. No more sorrow, no more dying, no more pain, no more tears. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Being able to eat from the tree of life, all of the, being able to pet a lion, that would be so cool, right? Just simple things that I, that I think about in heaven and, and how it brings peace to my heart. But that's not why I want to go there, right? We don't really have some of these things here, but um, it's not like we'll have there. But we're looking forward to them. We don't want to be looking forward to those mansions in those streets of gold. We want to be looking towards worshiping directly with God right there at the throne. I mean, the Bible describes it in a way that I don't even think fully describes it. Right? Only wor Words can only describe it so well. When you talk about a translucent um, material in the walls and in the foundations, I don't even know how to picture that in my head. It's described as a pearl but not quite like that. It's, it's emeralds. I think they talk about the gates are made of gemstones. I mean, I don't even know that I can picture that. So many amazing things. But worshiping right there with God. The true value of the reward we will, we will receive will be to see and touch and speak with the one who gave all of heaven to ransom us from this world. It wasn't that he just temporarily put it aside. I hope you realize that. It wasn't that Jesus just said, here, hold this for me for a second. I'll be back. And came down to earth, did his work, and then went back and picked it up like it was nothing. He's not the same today as he was then. He has the same body he had on earth in heaven now. Different than it was before he came. He gave everything for us, for each one of us to touch and to speak with him who gave everything for us. We'll be with God forever. We will have eternity to learn from him. I'm, I'm a learner, right? I, my parents, my mom kind of gave me a hard time one time that they never thought that I'd be the one who would be a, a perpetual student. I didn't show a whole lot of inclination to that when I was younger. I was more sports oriented. School wasn't all that much fun. I was rather, I'd be like Esau. I wanted to go out and run in the fields and do the things but now I love learning that knowledge, that wisdom that comes from, from learning can't be taken away from you, which is amazing. Pretty much everything else can be taken except the things that you learn. We'll be able to see his ways of nurturing and creating. How tenderly he helped us when we fell. We'll be able to look back and see it. How he lovingly forgave us when we spitefully hurt him. These are the things that should hold the most value for us and should have our undivided attention. I admit it's, it's often easy to write words like this, but it's, uh, it's pretty hard to live by them, like I said. <clears throat> we struggle sometimes to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and to not be discouraged right here. We see so much going on in the world, how wicked it is and just keeps getting worse and worse. We know what will happen. You know, that pendulum is going to swing and pretty soon Christianity will become the, the flavor of the day or the forced worship of it or observance will come, and those who choose not to go that route will be persecuted. We will have our ability to even buy or sell anything removed. We will be forced to flee. How many of you know how to start a campfire when it's wet? Right? I don't know, Andrew, you're pretty small. How many of you can build a lean-to out of branches? Now, some of these aren't skills you need to go out and like learn today. Obviously, it's Sabbath, but we will be forced to go and live in places we're not familiar with or we're not comfortable with. But we don't have to fear because the Lord promises that in that time, he will watch over us. I encourage you, though, to take hold of the promise that he has, that he, that he who has begun a good work in us, he will finish it. 
because despite what may happen to us physically, despite our safety and our protection that may be taken away, that will be taken away, we have the ability to be faithful. We have the, the sure word of the Bible that tells us that he will finish the work in us if we will let him. You're here. You're in the remnant church at the cusp of the end of time. God didn't call you to this point believing that you would fail. He's provided every opportunity for us. God called you to this church at this time in history because he knows that if you can truly value these things that are important to him, putting everything else aside, and you can do this. We, I, can do this because you know that all of God's blessings are enablings. That if we can do this, then we will be with him forever. In closing, I wanted to say, I almost gave it away. The Lord asks us to cast all of our cares on him. Because why? Because he cares for you. Amen. Father, thank you for this message. For speaking to me. For helping me to understand where I should put the value in my life. Help me to order my life in the appropriate way. To put aside those things, Lord, that so easily beset me. To keep my eyes focused on you. Help each one of us, Father. Bless each one of us. May your Holy Spirit guide us in this Sabbath as we think about this message. Help us to see in our lives, Lord, where we need to make changes, where we need to adjust. And help us to see with your eyes the value that you have in others, that we can share your love with them. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.